So yeah, I'm a postdoc in the Ham Schiffer group. Uh, she couldn't be here, and so I'm talking uh, in place of her. Uh, if you looked at my abstract, it said that I was going to talk about a reduced explicitly correlated Hartree Fock or RxCHF in the nuclear electronic orbital or NEO framework applied to molecular systems. Uh, those calculations are still ongoing, and since it's research, they haven't actually been working up to what we were hoping the last two or three months. So I'm going to be talking about some recent work in the last couple weeks uh, of the RxCHF method applied to positronic atoms instead. Uh, the, even though it's a different system, it still uses the same improvements we've made to our code in the past year that's really enabled uh, like methodological advances. Uh, it still uses blue waters. It's just a, just a different system. So since this is the chemistry uh, like section, uh, going into this, I did not know much about positrons personally. We have a research professor uh, in my group who got a PhD in mathematical physics. And so I went and asked him you know, to teach me what I need to know about positrons. And he replied it would take me about three minutes to learn everything I needed to know as far as being a chemist. And so I'm going to impart that knowledge, assuming a lot of people here are chemists as well. So we all know a, a positron is the antiparticle of electron, or E+. Uh, as far as a quantum chemist, uh, a positron is just an electron. It, it interacts just the same, except the charge is flipped. Uh, so you have you know, your VEE type terms or your VEP type terms. One of the electrons changes to a positron. We just flip the sign of that interaction. Everything else is the same. The mass is the same. The strength of the interaction is the same. Uh, some background, experimentally observed in 1932 by Carl David Anderson. And so this is the really famous photograph of the cloud chamber uh, that my research professor I work with uh, waxed poetically about being one of the most beautiful photos of all 20th century physics. Uh, the path, so you can see that curve there, uh, the shape of it and the length tells you what type of particle it is. You run a uniform magnetic field down it uh, to where positive uh, charged particles curve one direction, negative charged particles curve the other direction. So it looks like an electron, but it curves the wrong direction. So he says, uh, totally unambiguous what it was, and he wishes he could have done something like that one day. Uh, so where we get positrons from experimentally uh, and for applications, uh, well, you can get them from two places, but uh, as far as applications, you normally get them from production by emission uh, from beta decay. So here we have a, a proton decaying into a neutron where we also get a positron and electron neutrino. Uh, so we have magnesium 23 here going to sodium 23 with production of a positron and that electron neutrino. Uh, you can also get them from pair production from uh, highly energetic photons. Uh, from my cosmic rays, and I think that's how this uh, photograph was originally observed. But uh, we're not going to be interested in that type of production at all. So, uh, since electron, uh, since positron is antimatter, we know when it comes into contact with an electron, uh, we have annihilation at uh, low energies. This normally results in the production of two gamma uh, photons, a point one, uh, point five one one mega eV, where point five one one mega eV is the rest mass of the electron, the rest mass of the uh, the positron, uh, you, depending on the spin states, uh, you can get three gamma rays. Uh, if, if it's higher energy, you can get four, six, or eight. But for uh, the experimental systems uh, where there's data, uh, the most recent experiments with positron binding, you're normally going to get two gamma rays. Uh, and this is what you observe in your detector uh, to determine if annihilation has occurred. And like uh, in applications like for PET scans, uh, you would observe this kind of gamma radiation. The other concept we need is this idea of positronium. Uh, and so it's a bound atom-like electron-positron pair. Uh, it's metastable, so it will eventually annihilate. Uh, and you can kind of think of it like a hydrogen atom uh, with the proton being replaced by a positron. That might not be the best analogy because the electron-positron masses are the same versus the proton, of course, weighing like 1,800 times more than the electron. But it, it's a metastable hydrogen kind of like atom in a way. And uh, you see this experimentally uh, and theoretically in various systems. So applications, uh, I come from a method development background. So I think this is the first time I've ever been able to give uh, an application slide and not like be lying through my teeth about like various real applications of it. Uh, positrons get used in PET scans or positron emission tomography. So it provides images and metabolic processes. Uh, you basically inject uh, fluorodeoxyglucose or a glucose derivative that has a fluorine 18. Uh, it undergoes decay uh, and produces a, a positron, which then annihilates, and you measure the gamma radiation, and you can uh, get images of the body seen here. 
Uh, it gets used uh, for cancer imaging uh, because we can think of cancer as being like a runaway metabolic process, and so the cancer cells take up the glucose faster, and so we see more uh, annihilation in those areas. Uh, it can also be used to do brain scans, uh, where the idea is that where there's more uh, blood flow to the brain, there's more brain activity, and where there's more blood flow, there's more glucose, and so we can use that as well. Uh, it looks like that's starting to be somewhat superseded by a FR MRI or functional MRI, but PET scans for brain activity are still commonly used as well. Now, the other big application uh, is positron emission <coughs> spectroscopy. So that's used to observe voids and defects in solids. So like in a metal, you know, we have pretty much free electrons, and so positrons are going to annihilate very, very quickly in that type of environment. Uh, but if there's a defect or a void in there, the positron can form positronium in these, uh, in these voids or these defects, and the uh, annihilation rate goes down, and that's measurable. And, and so it, positrons get used in other places, too, uh, in, in uh, astrophysics, and uh, someone's trying to even like make an annihilation uh, laser, but, but these are the two main ones. So calculations on positronic and positronium atoms. Uh, yes, I even showed up. So that's my first time using this graphic, so I just wanted to make sure it looked good. Uh, so there's been a lot of calculations on positronic and positronium atoms. When I say positronic atom, I mean the neutral atom with a positron added to it. When I say positronium atom, I mean the neutral atom with positronium. Or alternatively, you can think of it as a negatively charged ion plus a positronium. Uh, so on this table on the right, it's color-coded, where the top means uh, the atom binds a positron, the blue means it binds a positronium, and the green means it binds both. And uh, you can see that a lot of atoms will bind a, pos uh, a positron or a positronium. This table is made with a bunch of different methods. Uh, so these methods, SVM, SVM, FC, uh, are stochastic variational methods, or ECG, explicit correlated Gaussian type methods. They're very, very accurate, but require uh, uh, a small number of, of quantum particles. They don't scale very well. And so those are mainly on the left side uh, because they use a, a, a pseudo potential for the core, and so they have less uh, valence electrons. On the right side there, they use this CIFC, where it's a multi-reference CI type method, where this infinity represents uh, extrapolation to complete basis set limit. Uh, MBPT is just many body perturbation theory, uh, which is also used more on the right side of this table. Uh, mean field and DFT approaches have not predicted binding. Uh, and we've even tried this recently in our group to see if they would uh, for positrons to atoms. Uh, another thing to mention, so for the uh, binding energies for positronium atoms uh, always decay into positronium in the neutral atom, but for positronic atoms, we actually have two decay channels. It can decay into the uh, positron plus the neutral atom or positronium plus the negatively charged atom. And so you have to check both of those. Uh, as far as... Uh, Experimental numbers, uh, there don't really exist for these atomic type systems, and this is somewhere theory is uh, currently very much ahead of, uh, of the experiments. Uh, as far as experiments, uh, they've looked more at molecular systems, and so they have an emphasis on annihilation rates. Uh, these annihilation rates are enhanced by what are called uh, vibrational Festbach resonances, and these are really hard to compute uh, theoretically because you have to couple uh, various modes are various degrees of freedom. Uh, also, uh, experimentally, they tend to look at larger systems, as you can see from the binding energies they have here. Uh, with the focus on annihilation rates, the reason they do that is they can measure that directly, and the binding energies are measured indirectly. And so they're, they're kind of harder to compute as well. And so the theor theoreticians have been computing binding energies. The experimentalists focus a little more on these annihilation rates. And so there's kind of a disconnect between experiments and, uh, and computation right now. Uh, the experiments are very difficult as well. Uh, reading that literature, they uh, exhibit a great degree of humility uh, in a lot of their papers to where they say that, you know, they're not for sure what's going on there, and they'd really like uh, theory to come in and, and maybe help them in, in some way for these larger systems. The problem with these larger systems is the accurate methods I had on the previous slide, uh, they don't really scale up to these alkane-type systems. Uh, that the experiments are done on. So for molecules, there's been high-level calculations on diatomics and triatomics. Uh, by high level, I mean like SVM or uh, QMC type methods. Uh, for ab initio methods with a mean field reference, they've done calculations on amino acids and DNA base pairs. And this is because those type of molecules exhibit uh, a large dipole moment. Uh, and there's been a prediction that any molecule with a dipole moment greater 1.625 to bi will bind a positron. 
And so these mean field methods will, uh, you know, our DFT type methods will bind a positron for amino acids. But uh, when you look at something like an alkane, and so I have uh, pictures on the right there of mean field type methods where you kind of see what the orbitals look like. So the blue on the bottom is the positron, that where it's really diffuse. Uh, but when you look at alkanes or something like that, uh, these mean field methods don't uh, predict binding. And that's thought because uh, that they lack uh, explicit electron-positron correlation. And the methods that do include electron-positron correlation really can't scale up to the size of an alkane. Uh, to where they're just computationally intractable. Uh, so the RxCHF method that I've mentioned on the first slide uh, includes explicit electron-proton correlation because we're normally interested in molecular systems, but there's no reason we couldn't do positrons in instead. Uh, and we should be able to do uh, molecular-type systems. Uh, you know, it, it would be uh, computationally very demanding, but it would be reasonable. And so what we've recently done is adapted the RxCHF method to positron type systems, and we started by benchmarking on atoms before moving on to molecules. So, Neo RxCHF, the idea of it is I have n electrons, one quantum nucleus, or, or a positron in this case, and I uh, split my electrons or partition them into two systems uh, NR regular electrons, NS special electrons uh, for, let's see, oh, that's useful. Uh, for the, I have a Slater determinant of regulars, a Slater determinant of specials, I have my positron orbital, and then I have this correlation factor that couples the positron to select spin orbitals or to the special spin orbitals here. Uh, and I only couple select ones, and I, there's another, if you knock this reduced off, we have an explicitly correlated hartree flock which couples all of them, but I can get away with coupling select ones uh, because for when we looked at molecular systems for like HCN or hydrogen difluoride, uh, the orbital is very localized around the quantum particle, and so that interaction is pretty local. So for like positron systems, we think we shouldn't have to couple the core orbitals, let's say, because the positron is not going to be near the, the nucleus uh, really at all uh, due to the, the repulsion there. Uh, the reason we want to only couple select spin orbitals is it greatly reduces the computational cost of our calculation. Uh, and the, if we take that onsatz then, and I can just apply uh, the normal variational conditions, and I get three Fock-like equations out from that. I get one for regulars, one for special electrons, and one for my positron. Uh, these are all coupled to each other as well. And so not only do you have to solve uh, each of these individually iteratively, you have to solve all three of them iteratively together. Uh, the Hamiltonian for this system is just what you think it is. It's normal electronic Schrodinger uh, Hamiltonian plus the kinetic energy of the positron and interactions of the positron with classical nuclei, other positrons, and other electrons. Uh, when I partition my regular and special electrons into two sets, uh, I make them distinguishable, uh, distinguishable particles, and so there's no longer exchange between those two types of particles, and so we can back in approximate exchange if needed. Uh, the bad thing for doing that is I don't have a wave function that has exchange between the two particles, and so when I calculate properties, uh, I'm calculating properties with a wave function that neglects exchange. And so that, that's a real approximation, but in practice, the properties still end up being pretty good. So, uh, so the RxCHF, the equations are kind of complex, but they're straightforward to derive. The problem with RxCHF is it has a very high computational expense, and that's why we need blue waters. So normal hartree fock you know, I have these just two particle Coulombic type integrals. In RxCHF, I have three, four, and five particle type integrals, and each of the type of, do the geminal coupling, and each of those integrals is much harder to solve for than a normal hartree fock type theory. So we do our integrals over charge distributions, and so I have like a four-particle integral here. And the operator, instead of just being a nice 1 over R12 operator, uh, I have different types of four-particle integrals as well. And so our integrals are way more numerous, and, and they're much harder to solve for compared to normal hartree fock as well. Uh, just to give you an idea, for HCN 631 GDP basis, uh, which is a pretty small basis set, Number of non permutational unique integrals for RxCHF, it's like 1.5 times 10 to the 12th, whereas for Hartree Fock, it's 1.5 times 10 to the 6th. In practice, you divide that by 8 because we only keep permutationally unique for Hartree Fock, but the way the old Neo code was, we actually computed and stored all of the integrals, and so that's why I'm making that comparison. Uh, so, like I said, we stored all the integrals in memory, so even for a small system like here, we needed 12 terabytes of memory to store all, all of our integrals. And so, we really hope to do larger than HCN type systems, uh, and we were rapidly going to be both memory and compute bound. So the most recent 
uh, improvements over the past year, like since I talked here one year ago. So uh, last year we could do HCN with a PC0 basis, 11S proton basis, and that took about five hours on 128 nodes on Blue Waters. Uh, the most uh, the best improvement we made, our most recent improvement, is we have a faster integral code in collaboration with Todd Martinez's group at Stanford, uh, and that's given us about a 10 to 5th to 10 to 6th speed up in the calculation of these integrals. So, so uh, we are not integral experts. Todd Martinez really is, uh, and he, he's great at it, or, or his group is great at it. And now on HCN, I can do last year's calculation in 6 seconds on 16 nodes on Blue Waters. Uh, since I can do these calculations faster now, Instead of storing all the integrals in memory, I can do what's called a so-called direct algorithm, where I calculate the integrals on the fly, contract them with the density matrix to form the Fock matrix, and do that every iteration. So the integrals are just used as needed and discarded. Uh, and so I do end up having to calculate the integrals more often, but since I, I have this 10 to 5th, 10 to 6th speed up, I can get away with that. And now uh, the integrals basically are written to a buffer, and so it's controllable, the amount of memory I need, to where they're really about the size of the two particle uh, uh, integrals are the same size as Hartree Flux. We still store those in memory just because it's easier. And, and uh, Blue Waters, of course, has plenty of memory to store two particle integrals. So now for something like HCN, 631 GDP basis, 5S, 2P, 2P, D proton, I can do about 40 minutes on 32 nodes. And uh, there's no reason we can't go larger than that. So that's been the main methodological improvement over the past year. Uh, and it's really enabled us to start looking at larger and larger systems to where, you know, uh, we really couldn't do a lot a year ago just because of computational expense. So for benchmarking, uh, I we really want to look at positrons binding to molecules, but we're going to start with atoms since we have high quality data there. Uh, and so we're going to look at the alkaline and alkaline earth metal atoms because that's where that SVM or explicitly correlated Gaussian data was that, that's very high quality. Uh, for the alkali metals, we're going to couple one spin orbital because there's one valence electron. For the alkaline earth metals, we're going to couple two spin orbitals because uh, there's two valence electrons, standard electronic basis sets. For the positron, we're going to use an S-type basis that's even tempered. It's just exponentially spaced. Uh, this comes from Klaus Rudenberg in the 70s, and it's really pretty diffuse. Uh, and then I'll skip this different onsides because I'm probably running close to time. Uh, so for the actual binding energies, th these are the best kind of like computed values, the ones I believe uh, to be best. And then we see the various NEO ones. And we're normally within like 0.1 EV. Now, in absolute relative terms, sometimes we can be a factor of 10 off, like between these two. But really, 0.1 EV uh, in absolute terms uh, is pretty small considering some of the approximations we're making in the NEO method, uh, specifically that we're neglecting electron-electron <laughs> correlation uh, for, for our system. And, uh, you know, we have that approximate exchange built in as well. And so, so we have some real approximations to where just predicting binding uh, like for the same systems that the best method does really means we're probably doing pretty well here. Uh, I checked these with uh, the mean field type methods just to make sure they did not predict binding and they did not. So basically, a, a electron-positron correlation is really important to get binding in these systems. And it looks like we're doing this correctly. Uh, so we haven't been able to move on to molecules yet. That's probably like in the next couple weeks, next month. Uh, but we're, these lead me to believe that we should be able to do that and that we're hopeful we'll be able to do uh, electron, uh, uh, positron binding to molecules for, like for alkanes uh, with an Abinicio method for, for the first time. Yeah. So RxCHF future. Uh, so I talked about positronic atoms. Uh, right now I'm actually running positronium atoms. And those are harder because the positronium uh, wants to be farther from the nucleus because uh, it's more weakly bound. So you need to use larger basis sets. And uh, the computational expense is still tough for us. But, but looking into that, we want to do molecules. So we want to do alkanes. Uh, we'd like to go back and do amino acids and DNA base pairs because those are previously done with the mean field reference uh, type methods that we think are only showing binding due to this dipole down the molecule. And we think electron positron correlation might play an important role in, in that kind of binding to see what kind of differences. Uh, and then lastly, we'd like to add electron-electron correlation. Uh, we have some ideas for doing like a truncated CI type expansion involving the special electrons and the positron orbitals. Uh, we also have a variant of DFT, multi-component DFT, where you have different types of quantum particles. So you can do DFT both for positrons and for electrons, and we could add electron-electron correlation in that way. So acknowledgments, UIUC, uh, my advisor, Sharon Ham Schiffer. Uh, Mike Pack is the research professor uh, that, that I worked with and helped a lot with the positron type stuff. 
at Stanford and to Todd Martinez's group. Andrew Cormenici is a senior staff scientist there and is the one that did a lot of the, the legwork in getting those integrals up and running. Uh, funding from NSF and lastly, Blue Waters. Uh, even with these small basis sets that I was showing like OGPC, uh, SEG1, uh, they still require Blue Waters and they're beyond the resources of our group to where we really wouldn't be able to run these uh, without a, a resource like Blue Waters. So with that, uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>